If you'd like to follow along with the reading, it is on page 143 of the Pew Bible. The Good News According to Deuteronomy. Glory to you, O Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The Lord your God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name alone you shall swear. Do not follow any other gods, any of the gods of the peoples who are all around you, because the Lord your God who is present with you is a jealous God. The anger of the Lord your God would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you from the face of the earth. Do not put the Lord your God to the test, as you tested him at Massa. You must diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his decrees and his statutes that he has commanded you. Do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, so that it may go well with you, and so that you may go in and occupy the good land that the Lord swore to your ancestors, thrusting out all your enemies from before you as the Lord has promised. When your children ask you in time to come, what is the meaning of the decrees and the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your children, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. The Lord displayed before our eyes great and awesome signs and wonders against Egypt, against Pharaoh and all his households. He brought us out from there in order to bring us in, to give us the land that he promised on oath to our ancestors. Then the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our lasting good, so as to keep us alive, as is now the case. If we diligently observe this entire commandment before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, we will be in the right. The story comes to us from the ancient and living words of Scripture. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace to you from God the Creator, Christ the Resurrected One, and the Holy Spirit who is with us now. Amen. We are in the last three weeks of our summer series, The Good Book, where we've been diving into some of the lesser known stories and books of the Hebrew Bible. These are the stories that Jesus would have learned as he grew up. These are the stories that shaped him and informed his ministry. In the version of the Bible that we typically use as Protestants, there are 66 books. 39 in the Hebrew Bible, and 27 in the New Testament. And so even in an entire summer series, we're not reading from every book in the Hebrew Bible. And in the course of a year, we don't read from every book in the New Testament. This fall, Dr. Jim Olhoff is leading a group in reading the entire Bible, all 66 books in a year. So if the full range of scripture is something you want to dig into, there are sign-ups available for that. This morning we've read from two books, the Book of Psalms and the Book of Deuteronomy. The Book of Psalms is a song book used for worship and prayer. There's songs of lament, songs of praise, songs of remembering, songs of despair, and songs of hope. The book of Deuteronomy is the fifth book in the Hebrew Bible and is comprised of a series of sermons and teachings from Moses after the Israelites fled enslavement in Egypt, retelling the story of their wilderness wanderings and passing down important teachings to those who receive these stories before they enter into the next phase of their life together as community. The Israelites have experienced a time of trial and trauma and are telling the story of who they've been and who they will be. They are sharing lessons and teachings to pass down, stories they will return to again and again to remind them of who they are. 
Throughout the summer, we have been exploring these stories that are in our lineage of faith, gleaning wisdom while acknowledging that all of these texts are part of a rich and complicated human history. In the text from Deuteronomy, we are told to keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, let these words be our guideposts. Write them on our hearts, live them in the world, pass them on, remember them. Whenever we're thinking about legacy, the things we pass on to others, if you're someone with kids, there's a clear path of lineage. Parents and grandparents and caretakers are modeling how to live in the world to those you're caring for and shaping. For those of us without kids, or who are kids, there is a vital place in the conversation of legacy for us as well, because we are made to be community for each other. As much as the world as it is tries to tell us that we are meant to be independent, to be self-sufficient, to solve our own problems, and to care about ourselves first, our faith tells us something different. We are made to learn from each other, to care for each other, to acknowledge the ways that our words and our actions impact our neighbors, to be shaped by those around us and those who came before us. That means in each of our everyday lives, we are shaping the lives of others, shaping the world we live in simply by existing. All of us as community are called to pass on the words and stories of scripture that tell of our God who is vast, and knowable and unknowable, loving and steadfast, and sometimes frightening. God is as much of the hurricane as God is of the wildflower. But through it all, we are God's people, the sheep of God's pasture. In a few minutes, we will be welcoming Summer to her new life in Christ through baptism. As part of the baptismal rite, where God comes to us through water and the word, we as a community will make promises to support her and pray for her, to pass on stories and lessons and teachings, modeling God's love through our own actions. We are fulfilling our own baptismal promises by doing that, continuing to remind each other to love God and to be loved. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Jesus knew these words. He named them as the most important commandment when asked in the Gospel of Mark. And how we live that out, how we love the Lord our God with all our hearts, is shaped by our experience in the world, our families, and the lessons that have been passed on to us from teachers, elders, and strangers. Who taught you how to love the Lord our God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might? What lessons were passed on to you from teachers, from family, from kids, from strangers? How has this commandment shaped your life and actions and how does it continue to do so? For Jesus, he pairs this commandment with a second in the Gospel of Mark, to love your neighbors as yourself. For Jesus, the way he encourages us to love God with all our heart and soul and might is to love our neighbors with all of our heart and soul and might. And this is a community that strives to live out that love in practical ways, from welcoming folks to worship to cooking and serving meals, to weed-whacking the church grounds, to checking in on your neighbors, speaking a kind word to service workers, caring for yourself in times of grief and crisis, and all of the small and ordinary ways that each of us live love in the world. 
not because it makes us good people to do so, but because loving God fiercely shapes us and gives us a guidepost for how to live our lives in a messy and imperfect world. And in a world where we are so often judged by how much power we have, or our job title, or the choices we make about our own lives, it is radical and beautiful to center ourselves in love, always in love. I know for me, when I center my actions on loving God with all my heart and soul and might, moving through the world feels different than the moments when I'm entangled with our human systems of power and separation. I have a different emotional response if I'm cut off in traffic on a day where I'm centered in loving God and loving my neighbor than on a day when the temptations of the world are loud in my heart. And the more that we practice loving God and our neighbors, the more the temptations of the world are nuisances, not commandments. Loving God changes us. Loving our neighbors changes us. That's not to say it's easy to love God with our whole selves in every minute of every day. We live in the midst of a world where so much is designed to distract us from God and each other, to separate us, to divide us. We will each have moments where God feels far away as we grieve or rage or feel lost. We are constantly tempted to strive for ourselves first, not trusting that by loving God and loving our neighbors, we are also loving ourselves and co-creating a world where love is abundant and where there is always enough. Beloveds in Christ, you are named and claimed as gods. You are always beloved by God as you are in this moment and as who you will be in all the moments to come. And in response to that love, we are called to love God and love our neighbors. That's it. We will be imperfect at living love in the world, but God is always inviting us to return to God, to return to each other, to return to the stories and songs that remind us that we are gods and we are beloved, and to pass those stories on. Amen. <laughs>